Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Jai Jai Sri Chaitanya Jai Nityananda. Jai Dwaita Chandra Jai Kaur Bhakta Vrinda. Jai Jai Sri Chaitanya Jai Nityananda. Jai Dwaita Chandra Jai Kaur Bhakta Vrinda. Jai Jai Shri Chaitanya Jai Nityananda Jai Dwaita Chandra Jai Kaur Bhakta Vinda Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vanchakaupa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhaevacha Patita Nam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadegor Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So today the topic which I've been asked to speak on is titled The Process of Devotion and this is Actually, in the Madhya Lila of Chaitanya Charitamrita, there's chapter number 22. So, last night we had our God brother, Satchakrit Prabhu, he spoke about the meeting of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and uh, Rupa and Sanatan and the teachings of Rupa and Sanatan. So last night he described also how Sanatan had been arrested by the Nawab. You know, if you go to Ramakili, Ramakili is a very, very wonderful place, very, very famous actually. A lot of tourists come to Ramakili. Now, devotees also go to Ramakili. We like to go to Ramakali because we remember the pastimes of Rupa and Sanatan. They were living there in Ramakali, and it was in Ramakali Lord Chaitanya came there and met them. As we heard last night, Lord Chaitanya went to Ramakali and he met with Rupa and Sanatan. And after meeting with Lord Chaitanya, then Rupa and Sanatan were convinced that they must join Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement. And so Rupa Goswami, he was able to leave immediately. But for some reason, Sanatana was not able to immediately leave. And it happened that the Nawab had him arrested. Now, I was saying Ramakali is famous. But it's not just for Rupa and Sanatan. It's not that everyone who goes there are Vaishnavas. A lot of historians also go to Ramakali because the Nawab, Nawab Hussein Shah, he was ruling Bengal. He was, it's described that Chankazi in Krishna Leela was Kamsa. And the Nawab Hussein Shah he was Jarasandha in Krishna Lila. That's how we understand the relationship with these two Mohammedan uh, rulers. The Chankazi was the, the magistrate here in Mayapur 
and the Nawab Hussein Shah, he had his emperor's palace at Ramakili. And so there are, there are ruins there from the times of the Nawab Hussein Shah. His palace, his uh, residence, different things which he had there, which he had built. There, there are many ruins there which are all protected by the archaeologically, by the archaeological foundation of India. And historians come from around the world. They come to see these ruins. And one of the places which we go to see when we're there in Ramakali, there's a, a special big, it's a big uh, kind of amphitheater like a like a mosque or something, I don't know, but anyway, they say this was the prison where Sanatana Goswami was held. And sometimes when we go on Parikram, devotees will do the drama of Sanatana in the jail and how he talks to the jailer and how he influences the jailer. Because Nawab, uh, remember, Rupa and Sanatana had become Mohammedans, and they were known as Dabir Khas and Sakara Malik. So Sanatan was in the jail, and how to get out? So he spoke very nicely to the jailer, and he told the jailer that if you let me go free, I'm going to go to Mecca, and I will offer prayers on your behalf in Mecca. And then he said, just, he said, and I want to also give you some money also. So Rupert Goswami, he had left 25% of his savings. He had left it for emergency purposes. And so this was used by Sanatana Goswami to bribe the jailer so that he could get out of the prison there in Ramakali. So it's, it's very wonderful. I encourage all of you, if you have not been to Ramakali, you definitely do want to go and see. It's, it's, a, it's a very, very wonderful place. And Rupa and Sanatan, when they were living there, they were making it like Vrindavan. And they had different cones made. And, oh, it... It's a very transcendental place. Everywhere around you see herds, small herds of cows. Many cows kept there. Now we have purchased land there in Ramakali. ISKCON have managed to get a plot of land and they're going to develop some uh, facility there. But it, it's a very special place. And generally I said people go there because of the Nawab. We go there because of Rupa and Sanatan to, see, to hear about the pastimes. And one of the, the, there's a temple there where Sanatana Goswami was staying and it's taken care of by the government of India. And very nice small temple and the deities are well taken care of. And they have also Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada. He placed also the lotus feet of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu there. So it's, it's a very special place because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu visited there and Rupa and Sanatan lived there. And it's, it's very beautiful. And just near to there, not far away from uh, Ramakali, you can go to uh, Kanai Natsala which is also an ISKCON center there in Kanai Natsala, which is a whole another pastime. We won't, we won't get into it. We're talking about Sanatana Goswami and how he went, after he got out of the jail in Ramakali, then he went to meet Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And he met Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in Varanasi. Now, when Varanasi... Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was in the company of Tapana Mishra and Chandrasekhar. Lord Chaitanya had come there and he was doing Sankirtan in the streets of Varanasi. If you go to Varanasi, even today, 
you can see how Varanasi is. Very narrow streets, very narrow, and, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just narrow streets everywhere. It's, it's not very big, but... Uh, there's a, there, there's a, this is a place where Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was and he was doing Sankirtan there through these lanes and through these streets in Varanasi. And it was there that Sanatana Goswami came to meet Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu told the devotees, there's a great devotee outside. Go outside and bring him in. So the devotee went outside and he said, no, there's nobody there. There's only one Muslim mendicant. And Lord Chaitanya said, oh, there's a Muslim. Yes, bring him in. That's him. And so they brought in this Muslim. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu rushed to go there and meet this Muslim mendicant. And Mahaprabhu and Sanatan Goswami embraced each other. So this was the uh, meeting of R Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu with Sanatana Goswami. Sanatana Goswami had given up his service to the Nawab. He had escaped from the jail and he had come to join Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had already met with Srila Rupa Goswami and he met with Rupa Goswami at Prayag and then he sent Rupa Goswami to Vrindavan. And so he'd instructed Rupa Goswami for 10 days there in Prayag. Then he came up to Varanasi and Sanatana Goswami came. And so Lord Chaitanya then spent some two months giving instructions to Srila Sanatana Goswami. So you can see in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, there's one chapter, which is Rupa Shiksha, but there are three chapters for Sanatana Shiksha. Because Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu spent two months giving the knowledge of devotional service to Srila Sanatana Goswami. So... The, the chapters 21, 22, 23 are all Lord Chaitanya's teachings to Sanatana Goswami. And the chapters are actually something like Sambandha, Abhidaya and Prayojana. Chapter 23 is concerned with love of God. Chapter 22, which we're going to speak about today, is concerned with the process of devotion. And chapter 21 is Sambandha, describing Lord Ch Sri Krishna and his qualities and his relationship with the world. So, the process of devotion, this chapter number 22, begins with Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, first of all, describing how the Supreme Lord has many different expansions. There are his personal expansions and there are his separated expansions. The separated expansions are the, the jivas, the living entities, all of us. Not only us, but the trees and the birds and the fish, that we're, we're all jivas. We're all the separated energy of Lord Krishna. And there's the personal expansions of Lord Krishna, which are there in the form of uh, those who are his personal associates and personal uh, personal expansions, just like the Chaturvyuha, uh, Aniruddha, Prajumna, Sankarshan, Vasudev, this, the Chaturvyuha, they're all the personal expansions of Lord Krishna. They're all 
Vishnu Tattva. Vishnu Tattva. In our Pancha Tattva, we have Advaita and Nityananda, who are also Vishnu Tattva, along with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Gadarha and Srivas are of a different Tattva, but Nityananda, Advaita and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu are all Vishnu Tattva. So the, the lotuses, lotus leaves are offered on the lotus feet of Vishnu Tattva forms of the Lord. But Toksi leaves are not offered on the lotus feet of the other forms. For example, Srimati Radharani or Gadarha Pandit or Srivas Thakur, they may hold Tosi in their hands to offer to the Lord, but they don't decorate themselves with Tosi. So, the Lord appears in all of these different forms. We know in the Brahma Samhita, it's mentioned how the Lord has Ananta Rup. He has unlimited forms. How many different forms does he have? We see the Lord's incarnations in this world. How many incarnations are there? As many as there are waves on the sea. There's an infinite number of waves on the sea. In the same way, there's an infinite number of the Lord's expansions and incarnations. And they're all for his for his pleasure, for his enjoyment. They come just simply to give pleasure to the Lord. So that is mentioned briefly in the beginning of this chapter. And after explaining about the liberated souls, then Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, after, rather after explaining about the Lord's personal expansions, then Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu goes on to describe about the jivas, the living entities. And he explains there are two kinds of jivas. There is a Nitya Siddha and a Nitya Badha. Nitya Siddha meaning the eternally liberated souls. Now the Nitya Siddha souls, they are all, the, they have no material desires. They're not under the material energy. They're fully liberated from the material energy. And they enjoy pastimes with the Lord. And they will take part in the Lord's different activities. When the Lord manifests himself in this world, then the Nitya Siddhas will also come and be with him to take part in his different pastimes. So the Nitya Siddha souls, some of them generally, they reside in the spiritual world. But sometimes the Lord does send a liberated soul into this world for the purpose of preaching and distributing Krishna consciousness. Sometimes under the direction of the Supreme Lord, the Nitya Siddhas will come into this world. But generally, the Nitya Siddhas are residents of the spiritual world. And they're not subject to any of the miseries of the material world. We know for it, on this planet, this is Mrityu Loka, the place of death. We live short lives. Death comes soon. But in the spiritual world, there is no death. There's no old age. There's no COVID. There's no disease. So that is the spiritual world. And the Nitya Siddhas, they're residing there eternally. The, the, the Nitya Bhadas, however, are here in this material world and they're constantly struggling with the material energy. Struggling with the three modes of material nature. And in this way they meet with sometimes happiness and often distress. 
It is the nature of the material world. Nitya Bhadas are always trying to conquer over the material energy and trying to e exploit the resources of the material world for the, our own sense gratification. In Bhagavad Gita it is described how there's another energy. Apariyamitasthvanyam prakritim vidime param jiva bhuta mahabaho yeidam daryate chagat. Lord Krishna is explaining that besides this material energy, there's another energy of mine which are all living entities who are struggling with the material nature, trying to exploit the world. So the living entity is described by Lord Krishna as being prakriti, Prakriti meaning the energy of the Lord. But the conditioned soul, due to his nitya bada nature, due to his covering of ignorance, he is thinking himself to be the parusha. He's thinking he is the enjoyer. This is the problem. We are thinking we are the enjoyer. And we are thinking this world is all here simply for our enjoyment. And there's no other purpose behind this world except for us to enjoy and take whatever we want for our own pleasure. So this is the ignorance of the Nityabhada. The Nityabhada, he's rebellious. He does not like to surrender to the will of the Supreme Lord. Constantly struggling. Yayedam Jaryate Jagat. And elsewhere in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna said, Mami Vamsa Jiva Loki, Jiva Bhutta Shanatana, Manashastrani Prakriti stani karshati. Prakriti stani karshati. We are struggling with the material nature. Why are we struggling with this material nature? Because yeyi dam daryate jagat. We are thinking this world is just here for us, for our exploitation, for us to enjoy independently of God. Now, in the beginning of this chapter, Srila Prabhupada was describing how there's even a class of Nityabhadas who declare themselves to be God. They actually, they actually preach to people that they themselves have become God, that they are the supreme and Srila Prabhupada writes in the purport how he said, it is the duty of our Krishna conscious devotees. He said, we have to do something about these people. He said, because these people are so low and they're so, such rascals that they're declaring themselves to be God and they should be punished. And Prabhupada gives an example it said, just like 5,000 years ago, there was a demon called Pondraka. Now, Pondraka had declared himself to be the Supreme Lord. And he'd even stuck on extra arms onto his body. He'd put on a couple of extra arms to give himself a forearm form. And he wrote a letter to Krishna, to Lord Krishna, telling Lord Krishna that I am the Supreme Lord and you should give that Sudarsan Chakra to me. He wrote a very nasty, insulting letter to Lord Krishna. And Lord Krishna, when he got the letter, he laughed. And when Lord Krishna actually came on the battlefield to confront Pundraka, 
he laughed even more because when he saw Pandraka, he just looked so ridiculous with his two arms stuck on and in this way declaring himself to be Lord Narayan. So Prabhupada said, Lord Krishna killed Pandraka immediately. Lord Krishna threw his Surasan chakra and decapitated him, cut off his head. And Prabhupada said, he said, I'm not saying that you should kill these people. <laughs> you know, uh, Prabhupada may have been a little worried that we take Prabhupada's words very seriously and we run around and start killing people who say they're God. But Prabhupada said, I'm, I'm not saying that you, you should kill these people, but you do have to defeat them and you have to expose them for what they are that they're doing the greatest disservice to society. By declaring themselves as God, they're bringing havoc onto the whole planet. And it is the duty of our Krishna consciousness movement to do something about this and to save the world from going to hell. And so this was one of Prabhupada's uh, powerful purports which are there in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. He was expressing his desire. And Prabhupada did appreciate whenever devotees would go and confront these people, then Srila Prabhupada would, would be very pleased and he would congratulate the devotee and tell them, you have done very well. Just like in Prabhupada's time, there was one scientist who was saying that he is going to make life from chemicals. So one of the devotees, Srila Prabhupada disciple, he wrote to this scientist and he challenged him. He said, I challenge you. If, he said, I will give you $10,000. Let me see you make life from chemicals. I will give you whatever chemicals you want. Let me see you make some life. And of course the scientist could not do it. So actually this devotee got a lot of publicity from it because he publicly challenged the scientist that you're telling the people you can create life. So let me see you do something. What can you make? Can you make even one egg? Like this, the devotee challenged everything. Of course, he'd heard from Prabhupada and he preached against the scientist and exposed. And then similarly also, we saw His Holiness Bhakti Swarup Damodar Maharaj uh, preaching also in a scientific conference where the one man was giving a seminar in which he was talking about creating life from chemicals. And so he, Bhakti Swarup Damodar Maharaj, at that time he was a brahmachari, Swarup Damodar Das Brahmachari, he said to him, if I give you the chemicals, can you create anything? And the scientist said, well, at the moment, no. <laughs> The scientist had to admit that he could not do anything. So Srila Prabhupada was appreciating these devotees, that they were boldly preaching the Krishna conscious philosophy. And this is our business as devotees. We have to expose this bogus propaganda, the atheistic philosophies which are being propagated. It's a big task. But Srila Prabhupada expected it and we must take up. This is the mission of our Krishna consciousness movement. We were hearing last night how uh, we offer our respects to Rupa Goswami that he is fulfilling the desire of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And so the desire of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu 
is to expose these rascals, just as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu defeated the Mayavadi philosophers in Benares, Prakashananda Sarasati. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu met with them and he preached to them the Vaishnava philosophy and they all accepted his preaching and they all chanted the Hare Krishna mantra by the influence of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is explaining to Srila Sanatana Goswami this process of devotion. And he explains about the, the condition of the Nitya Bada soul, souls. Nitya Bada, eternally conditioned. The eternally conditioned souls, they can become liberated. They need the mercy. They need some mercy. They are suffering. Suffering the miseries of the material world. Adi Baltic, Adi Atmic, Adi Daivik. These different miseries which are there in this material world. The miseries from other living entities. The miseries from our own body and mind. And miseries from the material nature. The, this world is not a very pleasant place. Although we try to cover up the miseries, actually it's constantly suffering with only a few moments of flickering pleasure in this world. So how to help the Nitya Bada soul? There is such a thing as uh, Kripa Siddha. Kripa Siddha, special mercy, causeless mercy. One time devotee asked Srila Prabhupada, what is Kripa Siddha? And Srila Prabhupada explained to the devotee, he said, just like if I come to you and offer you a million dollars, and you've never seen me before, and I just come and say, here, Here's a million dollars. Take it. That is Kripa Siddha. Special mercy. So, it's not very common for that to happen, right? You didn't get a million dollars like that. It's very unusual. So, Kripa Siddha is very rare. So, how can the Nitya Bada ever be liberated and become a Nitya Mukta. Well, the other process by which they can be liberated is by sadhana. You know, sadhana siddha. By sadhana, by spiritual practice, we can come to the liberated stage. Doing sadhana. But how to, how to perform sadhana? What is this sadhana which we should do? To understand what is sadhana, we have to have the grace of devotees. We have to have association with devotees. Without association with devotees, it will be very difficult for us to understand spiritual life. And it will be practically impossible for us to make progress in this world. We need to have association. We need to have somebody to guide us and to lead us. We need to see the examples. And without that, without seeing the examples, then it's very difficult for us to, pros to make any progress in spiritual life. So that association with the spiritual teacher, with the, spirit, with the advanced devotees, that is required. We have to get that kind of association. And we see this explained to us also in uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, in different places, it is described the importance of association with the advanced devotees. For example, 
it, it, it happens with Maharaj Rahugan and Jad Bharat. Maharaj Rahugan was a king of Sindhu and Soviri and he was being carried in his palanquin and he was going to visit holy places. I think it said he was going to Ganga Sagar. He was going on pilgrimage and he was going in a palanquin. So he was being carried by four strong men. But somehow one of them, had, one of the men carrying his palanquin had become injured and he was no longer able to carry palanquin. So Maharaj Rahugan needed to find someone else to replace the palanquin carrier. And at that time, he happened to see Jad Bharat. Jad Bharat was walking around, uh, looking just like he was Jad, like he was Jada. He was a, a dumb, a retarded person. His hair was disheveled, and his clothes were old and ragged, and not properly arranged. But he was strong, his body was strong, his physique was good. So Maharaj Rahugan thought, this one, he will do. He can carry my palanquin. And then Jad Bharat, he doesn't speak, he didn't usually speak to anyone, he would just be quiet. And so they told him, you do that, and he, he just did what he was told. And he started to t carry the palanquin. But when he was carrying the palanquin, there were some insects on the path. And Jad Bharat was very careful. He didn't want to harm any of the insects. So he began to step this way and that way. And in this way, Maharaj Rahugan, who was in the palanquin, he was being shaken. He was being shaken around. He was being almost knocked out of the palanquin. So he was shocked. What is going on? And he got down from the palanquin and then they told him, Oh, it's this one, this man. He was walking in a funny way. And so Maharaj Rahugan threatened Jad Bharat that if you don't carry the palanquin, palanquin properly, I will have you beaten. I will whip you myself if you don't carry it properly. Do what you're told. But when Maharaj Rahugan spoke in this harsh way to Jad Bharat, then Jad Bharat began to speak transcendental knowledge. And he said to Maharaj Rahugan, you know, you think you are the king. You think you are riding in the palanquin. And you think I am your palanquin carrier. You do not know who you are. You do not know who I am. You do not know what is the goal of life. You do not understand the truth. Maharaj Jad Bharat went on to speak in a very deep philosophical way to Maharaj Rahugan. And Maharaj Rahugan was just amazed to hear the wisdom and the philosophy which Jad Bharat was speaking. So Maharaj Rahugan fell at his feet and begged forgiveness. He said, oh, you, you are some great personality. I may have offended you. And he fell at his feet and begged forgiveness. And he also asked Jad Bharat, where did you get this transcendental knowledge from? How do you know all of this? Where did, who taught you all of this? So at that time, Jad Bharat explained, he said that you don't get this knowledge just by simply doing austerities. And you don't get it by uh, studying a lot of scriptures. You don't get this knowledge, you don't get this position, this, this state of consciousness by performing sacrifices or just by going to holy places and taking bath in holy rivers. 
and you may surround yourself by fires in the summer and you may bathe in freezing cold water in the winter so all of these austerities none of these things are any good to help you achieve the goal of life if you want to get the goal of life you have to take the dust from the feet of the devotees mm -hmm. You have to bathe in the dust of the feet of the pure devotees. Nesham matistavad rukramangrim sprishati anarto pagamor yadarta. Mahi yesham padarajo vishekam niskinsananam na priniti yavad. Like that, the nisk you have to find out the devotees the Paramahamsas who are freed from the miseries of material life who are situated on the transcendental platform and you have to get the dust from their feet. So this point was made by Jad Bharat in the fifth canto Srimad Bhagavatam and again you find the same point being made in the seventh canto in Prahlad Maharaj's case. Prahlad Maharaj had been sent by his father, Haranyakashipu, that he should go in the Gurukula for the, for the demons. Not the devotee Gurukula, but the demon Gurukula. And the demon Gurukula was to train them how to deal with their enemies. But Prahlad Maharaj had already been taught spiritual knowledge and he did not like this idea of thinking people to be the enemy. Then he thought everyone is, we should see everyone equally. No one is enemy, no one is friend, just see everyone equally. So Prahlad Maharaj was in the Gurukula. After some time, his father called for his son and he asked his son said now you have been in the Gurukula for some time tell me what is the best thing you have learned there so Prahlad immediately said to his father Shravanam Kirtan Vishnu and Haranyakashipu heard Vishnu what Vishnu Vishnu was the enemy of the family of Haranyakashipu because Haranyakashipu's brother Haranyaksha had been killed by Lord Vishnu in the form of the boar, Lord Varaha. So Haranyakashipu hated the, Lord, the name of Lord Vishnu. And when he heard Prahlad Maharaj tell him Shravanam Kirtan Vishnu, oh no, that, that was not the right thing to tell Haranyakashipu. And he got really upset with Prahlad and he was going to kill him. And at, Anyway, at one point he asked Prahlad, where did you get this knowledge? Who made you into a Vaishnava? How is it you have become a Vaishnava? Where did you get this from? Haranyakashipu had been very careful to keep him in the demon Gurukula and to keep him away from any devotees. He thought if any of the people of Vishnu come, they will contaminate him with their, with their Vaishnava teachings. So he was very careful that his son should not get any contact with the devotees. So he asked Prahlad, where did you get this from? And Prahlad Maharaj told his father, Materna Krishne Paratasvatova Bipajita Grehavratanam Adanta Gobir Vishatam Tamizram Punas Punacharvita Charvananam Prahlad Maharaj is saying that you don't get it just by your own efforts and you, go, you don't get it just by being with others. 
He said, if you've made a vow to stay in family life, then you're just chewing the chewed. You're chewing what has already been chewed. And then Prahlad went, Prahlad Maharaj then went on to say that you have to get the dust. You have to get the mercy from a devotee, from one who has devotion. Bhakti comes from a bhakta. You have to find out one who is a devotee. Actually, I say the word bhakta, is, that bhakta means new devotee. So I don't mean a new devotee. In Chaitanya Charitamrita, Prabhupada explains that bhakta is the term for new devotee. So sometimes people will sing Jaya Bhakta Prahlad. That's wrong. We shouldn't, think, we shouldn't say Jaya Bhakta Prahlad, but we should say Jai Prahlad Maharaj. Prahlad Maharaj, of course, is not a bhakta. And bhakta, Prabhupada does say in Chaitanya Charitamrita, that is the term for a, a neophyte devotee. So what kind of devotee do we have to get? To get devotional service, we should get the association with one who is niskinchana. Niskinchana means one who possesses nothing material. One who has nothing material to possess. He's given up attachment to the material world. That is the kind of association you want to get. And with the association of that kind of person, then you can make great progress in spiritual life. You have to associate with the Niskinchana devotees. Those devotees who are not anxious for material prosperity or material position or opulence or any of these things. You want to associate with that devotee and with his association then you can advance in Krishna consciousness. So to advance in Krishna consciousness Lord Krishna himself describes what kind of conscious, what should be our, our mentality in taking up the process of devotional service. It comes in the 11th canto, Srimad Bhagavatam. You'll see the Uddhava Gita is there. Lord Krishna is instructing Uddhava before he left this world. And Lord Krishna describes what should be the mentality of one who wants to progress in Krishna consciousness. First of all, he said he should have faith in the mission and in the teachings of Lord Krishna, particularly Bhagavad Gita. He, have to, he has to have faith in the, these instructions which are given there within the Bhagavad Gita. And he should carry out the instructions of the spiritual teacher. He should not be too much attached to material things. And at the same time, he should not be too much detached. If one is too much attached, then naturally it will be a distraction. We will be thinking about enjoyment. So you don't want to be too much attached. But at the same time, too much detachment is also not encouraged. Because too much detachment from the world can make the heart very hard and we will simply be bitter and we will criticize everybody. So we have to be very careful not being too much one way or the other. You have to be properly situated and we have to have the right faith. Faith is also a very important quality. Rupa Goswami describes the different stages of devotion, how it begins with faith. He says, Adau Shraddha Tata Sadhu Sangha Tabhajana Kriya Narta Nivriti. So in the beginning, one should have faith. 
But how to get that faith? Where are you going to get that faith from? You have to have association with devotees. Without the association of devotees, we will not have proper faith. We may have some feeling, some sentiment, some attraction, but the faith will not be very strong. So, actually, faith makes a distinction between one who is kanista, madhyam, and uttama according to the strength of their faith, one can be understood to be in these different positions. Who is Kanista? Who is the junior? And who is the intermediate? And who is the advanced devotee? In terms of their faith. One who has weak faith, then he is considered to be Kanista, neophyte that the faith is not yet mature. He has some interest, but not very much faith. And he meets people, and his faith can easily be disturbed. Just like a new devotee, he may, may be coming from a background where he was not vegetarian. And he becomes a devotee, he becomes a vegetarian, and people may say to him, Oh, vegetarian, oh, it's not good for health. Oh, you'll be very weak. Oh, you'll get sick easy if you're a vegetarian. And he may listen and he may believe it. He may not know how to argue and how to defeat these kind of people. But I remember as a young devotee, we would go out on Sankirtan, and we would distribute books in the streets. And sometimes people would say to us, why are you doing this? They say, why don't you just work and get a job like normal people? And they, they would say things like, you know, when you're old, who will take care of you? When you get old, who's going to look after you? You're spending your life distributing books to people. Who's going to take care of you? They would say these kind of things. And some people didn't have faith. They didn't know how to answer and how to respond to these kind of arguments. Of course, you can simply say to them, well, who's going to take care of you? Do you think you're saying who's going to take care of me? I'm serving Krishna. Krishna takes care of us. Krishna takes care of everyone. We have faith in Krishna that he looks after everyone. He's providing for the elephant. The elephant needs so many kilos of food. And the tiny insects like the ants, they need their grain of sugar. Who is providing for them? The same person who is providing for them, he is providing for us also. We live by the grace of God. We don't just live simply by our own efforts, but we live by the grace of God. And so do you, everyone. We are all living by the grace of God. You have a big factory. Your factory cannot produce any food. You need to have the grace of God to be able to grow food. So in this way, you go out on book distribution, you meet people, your faith will be challenged and you have to be able to defend yourself. You have to be able to answer these arguments. So one who is weak in faith, he can be disturbed by these things. That is the Kanista platform to be shaken. But the Madhyama devotee, Madhyama devotee has a little stronger faith and he has good faith but still his philosophy may not be very strong. He may not have all the arguments to defeat everyone. But he has full faith in whatever he's doing. 
And even though people may criticize him and may, they may put many doubts into his mind, he is not disturbed. His faith will remain strong. That is the Madhyama devotee. The Madhyama devotee makes distinction between people. Kanista devotee, he simply sees God in the temple and he doesn't see God in the hearts of other people. So generally neophyte devotees, they're encouraged to be more in the temple and worship the deity and gradually hear more spiritual knowledge. And with more spiritual knowledge, they can go on to understand how God is in the hearts of all living entities and to see God in all living entities, not only in the deity. So the Majjama devotee, he makes distinction. He will offer his worship to the Supreme Lord. He will associate with those who are his peers, those who are also devotees. He will give mercy to those who are innocent, who are willing to hear. And he will avoid those who are atheistic and blasphemers. He doesn't want to meet these kind of people. We may say, oh, we should be able to convince these people. <laughs> yes, we should be able, but not everybody is able to do this job. It's a difficult task. So the Madhyama devotee, he's not yet ready to confront these kind of people. So in the course of his preaching, he does have to make distinction between who is a good candidate to hear and who is not. Now somebody who is openly atheistic and blasphemous, an intermediate devotee doesn't want to spend time with him because it will be very difficult to change his mind. In the Kali Yuga, we see that people like to argue. They don't much care to hear. They just like to argue. And you get nowhere with it. You can spend so much time arguing with people and get nowhere. So we encourage the intermediate devotees. You don't waste time with these people who are agnostic, who don't believe in God and who don't have any interest and who are narrow-minded and not willing to hear. Rather, we look for the innocent people who are ready to hear. So that is the Madhyama devotee. He, he will make distinction. He's looking for the innocent people. He will avoid the atheists. And on the topmost platform, you have the Uttama devotees who are very expert. They have full faith in the philosophy and they're very expert in all the arguments and they can defeat whatever others come up with. Whatever arguments are presented to them by others, they can defeat these arguments. So this, this is the Uttama devotee. Now, sometimes Prabhupada will make distinction between Kanista, Madhyama and Uttama, not just simply in terms of faith, but it can also be in terms of their attachment to Krishna. That there is also attachment to Krishna. And the attachment in the neophyte devotee will be weak. The attachment in the intermediate devotee will be stronger. And the Uttama devotee, he will have the greatest attachment to Krishna. So this, there are different degrees of devotees. We see devotional service in this way. We have to get the association of devotees. Now, how much association do we need to get? From Chaitanya Charitamrita, 
we see Krishna does Kaviraj, he is given the verse about Lava Matra Sadhu Sangi Sarvasiddhi Hoy. That Lava Matra meaning a moment, a, a fraction of a second. It is said one eleventh of a second that one can associate with a devotee just for one eleventh of a second that can be sufficient for us to get all perfection. So association with devotees it doesn't have to be for a long time. Similarly in the first canto Srimad Bhagavatam there's a verse there describing the sages of Naimasharanya and they're also speaking about the importance of association with a devotee. Kulavena lavena pi lav kulavena lavena pi uh, naswargam nagatam param. They're saying it, that if you can get that just a moment's association with the devotee, lavena api, lavena again lavena that moment. An api, even a moment's association, then naswargam naparam gatim. That it's more valuable than going to heaven, it's more valuable than getting liberation, it's more valuable than doing a thousand sacrifices just to get that moment's association with the devotee. Again, with the devotee. Who is that devotee? That is that niskinchana devotee. That one who has given up all attachment to the material world and who sees everything in everyone in relation to Lord Krishna. We want to get that kind of association. Now, how do we get that association? So, in, the, in this uh, chapter of Chaitanya Charitamrita, again, we're speaking chapter 22, Lord Chaitanya's instructions to Sanatana Goswami. Uh, Srila Prabhupada raises the question, what is the qualification to get that association with the devotees. He said, is it just by accident that we get that association? Is it just by chance? And Srila Prabhupada quotes Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur's purport in this matter. And Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur has described that there, in addition to pious activities, there are also activities which give devotional service. There are different kinds of piety. First of all, you may perform activities of a mundane nature. You give charity, maybe for a children's home, or maybe for a hospital, or a school, or maybe you donate blood, different things like that. So that kind of pious activity, that will result in pious, the, the same benefit coming back to you. It will come back in the equal amount. As you give in charity for a, a cause, it will come back. And then, there are also charities or pious activities which are done, which are more in relation to getting liberation from this world. Just like if you give charity for a impersonal yoga society, some other yoga institution or some other spiritual society come and they're asking donations you give them a donation, that qualifies you for impersonal liberation. You can, you, that, that's the benefit, that you qualify for Sayuja Mukti, impersonal liberation. Because that's their goal. They're teaching that the goal of life is impersonalism, you should merge, you should become one, 
you should get Sayuja Mukti and if we contribute to them then we get the benefit they're offering. We become more qualified to share their benefits. But if we give to the devotee, the one who is propagating Krishna consciousness, then that qualifies us for devotional service. That is Bhakti Unmuli Sukriti. There's these different kinds of Sukriti. So there is Bhogan Muli Sukriti, which is material benefit. There's Mukti, uh, uh, Mukti Sukriti, where you qualify for liberation. And then Bhakti Unmuli Sukriti, where you qualify for devotion. So that is the qualification for entering into devotional service. If you do some activity like that. In Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna also describes Yesham Twantagatam Papam Jananam Punya Karmanam Te Danva Noham Nirmukta Bajanti Mam Dridavrita. Lord Krishna describes there in the Bhagavad Gita that people who have acted piously in previous lives and in this life and are free from all sinful reactions then they can engage themselves in my devotional service with determination. And so when the devotees were reading this verse one devotee he went to Prabhupada and he asked Prabhupada he said did we all become devotees because of our piety? Because it says in the Bhagavad Gita that you have to have acted piously in previous lives and in this life. So he said, is that why I am here now? Is that why I'm a devotee? Because I have done pious activities? And Prabhupada looked at him and laughed. And he said, I am creating your pious activities. Because the pious activities which bring us Krishna consciousness, these activities have to be performed in relation to a devotee. If you do pious activities in relation to non-devotees, it will not qualify you for devotional service. It will qualify you for some other material benefit, but not for devotional service. You want to get devotional service? Your pious activities have to be in relation to a devotee. So Srila Prabhupada was explaining to the devotee, because you have come to the Krishna consciousness movement, because you have done some pious, you've done something for our movement. Either you, you bought a book, or you helped a devotee, or you came to the temple and you got prasadam. Somehow or other you got some involvement with the Krishna Consciousness Society. And in this way you got the mercy of Srila Prabhupada, who is the founder of the society. And Srila Prabhupada is represented by this society. So when you do service for this society, it's not different from doing service for Srila Prabhupada himself. So this is how we come to Krishna consciousness. We get the association of the pure devotee in the form of Srila Prabhupada. Not necessarily his Vapu, but his Vani and his institution. And through that contact, then we learn about devotional service. And we come to Krishna consciousness. And we learn to take up all the activities of Krishna consciousness. Based on hearing and chanting, and remembering all these things. So there are many different angas or limbs of devotional service. You can read in the, in the Nectar of Devotion, Prabhupada has listed 64 different items of devotional service. 
first five begin in relation to the spiritual master and then there's others different things which we should do things which we shouldn't do but five of the items are stressed over all the others and these five items are what we call panch anga bhakti the five angas of bhakti and it is said a little attachment for any one of these five things can give us the greatest perfection so these five things are beginning with sadhu sangha association with devotees that's the first thing association with devotee and then nam kirtan the chanting of the holy names and then bhagavata shravan hearing the srimad bhagavatam and other scriptures so all of these things of course they come in association with devotees when you're with devotees then there will be kirtan and there will be also Bhagavata Shravan, you'll be hearing, you, just like now going on around Mayapur, there are many different lectures, different buildings, there are lectures going on. In the TOVP, there's so many classes going on. Over in the, in the uh, Mayapur Institute down there, there's classes going on. There's classes going on at the Gurukulas, there's classes going on all over Mayapur. There's a lot of hearing and chanting going on. And it's all in the association of devotees. So these three activities, Sadhu Sangha, Bhajana Kriya, Bhagavata Shravan, and then it says also Mathuravas, residing in a holy place like Mathura. So here we are, Mayapur. Mayapur is non-different from Vrindavan and also non-different from Jagannath Puri. This Naratam Das Thakur is a, is a the Gora, Gora Mandala Bhumi Nama Chintamani. He said this Gora Mandala Bhumi, this land of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, it is all Chintamani. It is all a wish fulfilling, all the, the dirt of the dham is chintamani, can fulfill all of our spiritual desires. So, this, there's, this living in the holy place is one of the five, and then the fifth one is worshipping the deities also. And so, we come here in Mayapur, and we have wonderful deities to worship. We can see beautiful deities, Gornitai, Panchatadva, Radha Madhava, Astasaki, Lord Nasringadev, Jagannath Baladev Subhadra. So many, wherever you go, you see so many wonderful deities. And it's so inspiring. So these five activities, these are the basis of bhakti, the devotional service. And we see these five activities are all there in our morning program. We have our programs in the temple every day. You go to the morning program, you'll get Sadhu Sangha. Devotees will be there. Association with devotees. You get Kirtan. You get Bhagavad. You'll hear the Shastras. And you will get also deity worship you see the deities being worshipped and you're also in the holy place because the temple is not anywhere in the material world the temple itself is the spiritual world you want so have try to understand how Srila Prabhupada was so expert he gave us so much within the morning program Everything is there. All these five activities are there. And so many other things are also there too. So we, take it, we want to take advantage every day. This morning program. Even if you're not staying in the temple, you want to do a morning program. You want to have your own program. You, you may be a householder. You may be far away from the temple. You want to have your own morning program. 
you should have an altar, you offer worship, you read the Shastras, you chant the holy name, and get the family to also join with you. Have Sadhu Sangha, get association. So these, these five activities, Panch Anga Bhakti, so powerful. And a little attachment for any one of these five things can give us the, uh, the greatest perfection. So in this way, Sanatana Goswami is hearing from Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu about the process of devotional service. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu began describing Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti. Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti means according to the rules and regulations. Right? In the beginning, we practice Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti. But, as you go on, you may become advanced. You may be advanced enough to go into Rag Anuga Bhakti, spontaneous devotion. Raganuga Sadhana Bhakti. Raganuga means spontaneous. The Prabhupada gives the example just like in the beginning to wake up in the morning. Maybe we're not very good at waking up early in the morning and you have an alarm clock to get you up. But then after some time, because you become habituated, you become regulated to waking up, after some time you don't need the alarm clock. You can get up without the clock. You just wake up naturally. So, in the same way in the beginning, we're following the different rules and regulations. Oh, yes, I have to do this. Oh, I have to bow down. Oh, I have to recite this mantra. Oh, I have to do my japa. And different things which we have to do. You know, we train our mind according to the rules and regulations. But as we go on, it will become more spontaneous that there will be this natural attraction to want to serve Krishna. And we won't be doing it just because it's a, oh, it's a rule. No, I have to do this, you have to do that. Oh, it's a rule. But we'll be, we'll be thinking more about Krishna. We want to please Krishna. And we were hearing from different speakers, they were speaking, the goal is to please Krishna. So we, that is the mood of Raganuga Bhakti, that the devotee has that Raga, that attachment to want to please Krishna. And they, they do this by cultivating the mood of great devotees. They will select a particular inhabitant of Vrindavan and they will follow in his feet, follow in his footsteps. We see in Vrindavan there are many eternal devotees of Lord Krishna, Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yashoda, the cowherd boys, the gopis, and we see also the cows as well, and all the calves. There are so many great devotees there in Vrindavan. So, every devotee wants to cultivate a mood. They want to, they should be, feel inspired to follow a particular resident of Vrindavan and to follow in his footsteps. And Everyone will be different, of course. Some, some people will want to follow, the, for example, the mood of the gopis, and some other people will want to follow the mood of the cowherd boys, or maybe Nanda Maharaj, maybe Mother Yashoda. Dif there's so many different devotees there. There's Krishna servants also, Raktak and Patrak. And you can cultivate the different moods of these devotees, cultivate their moods. And the, the, these devotees, they are ragatmika devotees. They have natural, spontaneous attraction to Krishna. And uh, we, we should cultivate the mode of following in the footsteps of one of these ragatmika devotees. Externally, we perform our sadhana. We continue 
with all of our activities of Krishna consciousness. But internally, we absorb our mind in the service of Radha and Krishna, according to these particular devotees, according to the mood of a particular devotee of Vrindavan. So that is Raga Nuga Bhakti. And it's mentioned at the end of the chapter. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu spoke about it. And Srila Prabhupada also spoke briefly about it. Where more, we give more importance to Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti. To following the different rules and regulations. Without coming to that level of spontaneous devotion. We should not just be premature about it. We have to cultivate a very deep attraction to the service of Krishna. We have to become very, very absorbed and dedicated to serving Krishna in the land of Vrindavan. And we follow in this way. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in this way, he described the process of devotional service to Srila Sanatana Goswami. He explained that the devotee of Krishna will have all good qualities. And he mentions all the different qualities of a devotee. They're all listed there in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. You can see many of the different qualities devotees should have. It's very important for us that we also will have proper behavior. Right? There's prachar and achar. So prachar is the preaching and achar is the action or the behavior. So we have to have the, the proper behavior, the proper mood. And we have to remember how we're representing the Krishna consciousness movement. I remember one year Prabhupada came here in Mayapur and it was the Gorpanima festival. It was very, well, it must have been like 1975 maybe. So there was only one building. There was only the Lotus building. And Prabhupada was in the temple room. He was giving like... Now many devotees had come from the USA at that time. Most of our devotees were from the USA and they'd come in big numbers for the festival and uh, met, some of them were also thinking of going to restaurants. They were thinking, well, I want to check out their food. You know, I'm thinking to open a restaurant in the USA so I should check out the restaurants here in India and then I'll know what we should be doing in the USA. However, when Prabhupada came in the temple room, he, one of the things which he said to all the devotees was, don't eat in the restaurants. He said, remember, now you are Vaishnavas and you have put on the neck beads, many of you have shaved your heads, you have shikas, and so on. You are dressed as Vaishnava. You, you should not go to sit and eat in the restaurants. That is not the mood of the devotees. So, sometimes these basic things which were taught to us directly by Srila Prabhupada, sometimes in the course of the years of our movement, sometimes they are forgotten about. And devotees become half-hand, they become slack, and we start to go here and there and everywhere and we eat outside and so on. We should understand that was not the mood and that was not what Prabhupada wanted. He wanted that we would behave properly. Anything which is uh, bad, which is, uh, which is not representing our Krishna consciousness, is not up to the standard, then it comes back on Prabhupada. Just like in the times, in the 1970s, we were doing a lot of book distribution and sometimes we would be very passionate in distributing books. And sometimes people would complain. And sometimes even they would write letters to Prabhupada complaining. 
and then Prabhupada would write back to them and apologize. He would say, I'm very sorry. Because th they would complain to Prabhupada and they would say, your devotee, he forced me to purchase the book. And Prabhupada would write back to them that I'm very sorry the devotee has acted in this manner. But you, then Prabhupada would also try to make up for it and he'd say that uh, you have to understand that this young man has dedicated his life to the service of Krishna and he's given everything and it's his own enthusiasm which he's asking you to kindly take our book. So please forgive his youthful enthusiasm. Please overlook it and take time to examine our Krishna conscious philosophy. So like that, Prabhupada was concerned when people would complain about our devotees. So we must be very conscious and try to uh, make a nice image. Over the years, of course, a lot of things have changed. Our movement is not based on it's not supported just by book distribution anymore. Although book distribution is still very important, we do have a big congregation supporting our movement. And that's good fortune for our movement. But at the same time, we still have the duty to maintain the proper behavior, the proper standards of eating and dressing that these things are very important for all of us as devotees. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was also imploring, he was teaching Sanatana Goswami about this, and later on Sanatana Goswami wrote Hari Bhakti Vilas, describing the behavior of a devotee, what is the proper action and proper standards of behavior for a devotee. So in this way, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teachings are being given to us today. All right, so... Uh, do you, is, is anybody here? To give? Yeah, question, question, answers. Huh? You can take question, answers. Question, answers, question, answers. Okay, question, any questions? Yes, pass the mic. Maharaj, Koto Vaik Maharaj, please accept our humble obeisances. Maharaj, actually there are two categories, one is the Nitya Siddhi and the Nitya, nitya Baddha. So the Nitya Baddha is, uh, because this is on par with the Vannasrama Dharma, isn't it? Religion, economic development and uh, the sensual uh, enjoyment plus liberation. Suppose if your liberation and the merging of uh, 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 God is what is the difference between those two? Liberation and the merging with the Lord. Liberation and what? Liberation and merging with the Lord, you know, that is for Siddha, Nitya Siddhi. Nitya, I, I haven't understood the whole question, Prabhu. Can you help me? So, once again, I can repeat, Prabhu Maharaj. So, there are two categories Nitya Siddha and Nitya Baddha. Yes. So Nitya Siddhas are, they are Paramahamsa devotees because they are more or less merging with the Lord. Whereas the Nitya Baddha, they are very much interested for their religion and economic development, sense gratification and liberation. Yes. So if that, that liberation is, uh, and this merging of the Lord, both are uh, same now, same purpose now. Well, the Nitya Baddha, you said he is interested in Dharma, Artha, Kama and Moksha. Yeah. Right? So you're asking, is that moksha? You're asking, is it the same as the, ni the liberated souls? That, uh, this liberation, liberation, uh, it is also reaching to the Lord now, Maharaj. And the merging of the Lord is also both the same now, because we are with the uh, Krishna conscious only. Well, you have to understand that the is this Nitya Vaddhas, they merge with the Lord? Is that the same with the Nitya Siddhas you are asking? No, not the same. The Nitya Siddhas, the eternally liberated souls, are not like an these uh, impersonal li 
uh, yogis who may achieve liberation. The impersonal yo impersonalists, their goal is liberation, but their liberation is only theoretical liberation. We described it as Sayujya Mukti. Now, devotees of the Lord, they will, we will never accept Sayujya Mukti or the merging with the Supreme. Because with Sayujya Mukti, there is no opportunity for devotional service. A devotee will never therefore accept that kind of liberation. Because there's no opportunity to engage in the service of the Lord. It is stated there in Srimad Bhagavatam, there's the verse, Yanyera Vindakshya Vabuktamani Das Twayasta Bhavad Abhishuddha Buddhaya Arora Krishrena Parampatam Tada Patanti Ado Nadreta Yasmad Angraya that those people who think they're liberated, the impersonalists, the jnanis, the Vedantists, they think they're liberated, but actually they're avishuddha buddhaya. That means their, their intelligence is polluted because they're, 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 for them, their liberation was becoming one with the Supreme but they will not be able to maintain that position of liberation. They may enter into the oneness of the Supreme, but they fall back again. Arora Krishrena patam tatam tada patanti adro nidreta yasmad They come back again into the material world. And we see big uh, impersonalist yogis who go out from the world, they reject the world, and then after some time they come back and they open their own, they open their home for the poor, or they have a, a school, or they open some hospital, they take up some welfare work. Because they have no spiritual engagement. They do not know what is actual spiritual activity. They give up the world. They reject all activities. They think activities are all material. They do not understand that there are such things as material activities. And they, they will simply engage in uh, some welfare activity because they have no, no knowledge of what is a spiritual activity. They cannot understand what is spiritual activity. That is th th what the kind of liberation these people get. It's useless. So you have to understand that the only real goal is bhakti. It's only by devotion that one can actually get out from this material world. And these impersonalists, they may get out for some time, but again they come back. They fall back again into the material world. So their liberation is not actually liberation because their brain is polluted by this material desire to become one with the Supreme. So this is what they get from their, all their efforts, all their trouble, all their endeavors, that they simply remain in the material world. But if you take up a little devotional service, even you don't have much knowledge, but if you do devotion, you can get the goal of life. You can enter into the spiritual world even you don't have much knowledge. But if you have that devotion to the lotus feet of the Lord, then you can get actual liberation. Liberation, there are five kinds of liberation, right? There, the Sayuja Mukti is the one which is never accepted by devotees. But there are four other kinds which may be taken. For example, Swarupya, uh, swam, swamipya, uh, there is a. Uh, huh? Okay, yeah. So there, there, there's four other kinds with becoming 
having the opulence with the Lord, living on the same planet with the Lord, having the same bodily features as the Lord, and being the companion of the Lord. Like that, this kind of liberation. Although the devotee does not desire this kind of liberation, but he can accept it. Because with these four kinds of liberation, he can do bhakti yoga. He can continue to engage in the service of the Lord. But with Sayuja Mukti, with the impersonal liberation, which is given to the jnanis, there's no opportunity to engage in devotional service. You understand? Yes, any other question? Hare Krishna Maharaj, Mataji was asking that you mentioned that uh, bhakti, we can get bhakti only from bhakta when we meet the devotee. But what leads to that meeting with the devotee? Is that pious activity or something else? That is the mercy of the devotee. By the mercy of the devotee. You need the mercy of the devotee. Devotees must be merciful. That is what we have to, that is where we are always in being encouraged. Go out, give Krishna consciousness, be merciful, give the mercy. The more we give the mercy to others, the more we get the mercy ourselves. You want the mercy? Give mercy. Go out and give mercy to others. You give Krishna conscious, and the more you're giving Krishna, the more you get Krishna yourself. So, it's, it's not that we do anything special to deserve the, the mercy. It's simply the mercy of the devotee. So, we're, we're very much indebted like that to the devotees, that they gave us, somehow we got mercy from a devotee, we're very much indebted to them. By their mercy only could we come to Krishna consciousness. Before we can have shraddha, before we can have faith, you have to have sadhu sangha. You have to have had some contact somewhere with the devotee, the vartma pradaksha guru, the one who shows you the path in the beginning, that he introduces you to Krishna consciousness. So that is the beginning. And we have to be indebted to the, this person, that they helped us, they showed us, they got us started. And we need that to come into Krishna consciousness. And then we have a little faith, we associated with the devotee. The devotee who we met, they had faith. And from them we got faith and that brings us into Krishna consciousness.
Hare Krishna. Any other question? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, yes. Dhanavad Pranam. Uh, Maharaj, you talked about uh, Akinchana devotee, Akinchana Vaishnav, and we should uh, associate with them. But uh, how, you, how we will know uh, who is uh, Akinchan Vaishnava and uh, how to approach them is my question. How do you know who is the Akinchana devotee? We have to know what, are, what to look for. If you don't know, then you won't find out who is Akinchana. Right? You have to know yourself. What are the qualities? Just like in third canto Srimad Bhagavatam, Lord Chaitanya, um, Lord Kapila is preaching to his mother Devahuti and he's telling his mother, you have to associate with a sadhu. And then he tells her the qualities of a sadhu. Right? And then that verse comes, Tatikshava, Karunika, Suridam, Sarvadehinam, Ajata, Shatravas, and Sadhava, Sadhu Bhushana, like that. Lord Kapila is telling his mother, what are the qualities to find out who is the sadhu? You have to see who is tolerant and who is uh, merciful and who is friendly to all living entities, who sees everyone equally, who knows the scriptures. So you have to test yourself. Just like when you're looking for a spiritual teacher, you don't just take the first person who comes along. But you have to test, you have to examine. You have to yourself look out, you have to observe and see, you have to inquire, you have to put questions and see is this person actually speaking the truth? Is everything he said, is it right? Am I, and, and, am I agreeing with everything he's teaching? You don't just come and take initiation from, oh, he dressed like a sadhu, he must be a sadhu. You don't just look at the dress. That's not the way. You have to hear. And Prabhupada said, you should hear for one year. And after one year, then you, you should be convinced that this person, he can help me. He can change me. You have to be convinced yourself. So like that, you have the, how to be convinced? You hear and put questions. Tadvidi prani patena. That's the process of approaching the sadhu. That you put questions to them. You inquire before them. Then that way you can understand who is actually niskinchana. Or, or who is not. You have to have develop your own faith by association, by seeing and hearing from him regularly. Not just seeing, but hearing. Very important. Right, Prabhu? Yes, one more. Thank you so much for the wonderful class. Maharaj, uh, very rightly you said that uh, we are representing Shula Prabhupada by having Tilakanti and initiation in ISKCON. Then, uh, like, ha to keep uh, proper behavior, but sometime when we see that the behavior is not proper uh, in the surrounding other Vaishnavas, then how to tolerate or uh, if that is not in our adhikar to rectify, then how to avoid the critical mentality? Because uh, it pains seeing that uh, when devotees are not following the basic etiquettes of eating, dressing and following the four regulative principles. Then you report to some authority. You find out who is the authority and report to them and, and put it to them. That you know you are the authority here. Do you, do you see this? Do you see how this person is? What they are doing? You have to approach the authority. Who is, that? who is the authority for these things? There must be some people who are authorities, who are in charge of these affairs, and you have to approach them and tell them, you know, why you allow like this? You are the authority. Why is it like this? 
Yes, Mara. Thank you so much. Mara, sometimes uh, many, uh, at many places the counselors themselves are not uh, following the basic etiquettes of eating and uh, that is the problem. So even sometimes people are not clear that initiation means uh, following four regulative principles properly. So can you just enlighten us that what it means to follow four regulative principles those who are initiated? Because people take it very loosely. Yes, it's a problem actually. I brought this up recently to Atul Krishna Prabhu who is in charge of the uh, examination system which they have for the ISKCON Disciple course. You know the ISKCON Disciple course is mandatory for people coming to ISKCON. So recently I was teaching a class and one devotee said to me that there's nothing in the ISKCON Disciple course which says that I can cook meat. He said, I'm not eating meat, I'm cooking it for my family. And there's nothing in the disciple course which says I cannot cook meat. And so I said, well, you read Prabhupada's books. And there are many issues, many places in Prabhupada's books where Prabhupada explains that you cook meat, it's as, that you get as much sin as when you buy meat and when you raise the animal, you kill the animal, you cook meat, you eat meat, you serve it to others, you get this, it's the same sin. You're going to get sinful reactions. So you're coming to Krishna consciousness, you shouldn't be touching meat. You shouldn't be buying meat, you shouldn't be cooking meat, you shouldn't be serving meat. These, sometimes people don't, they didn't understand that. They didn't know this. And that some people don't even agree. They say, well, it's not in the ISKCON Disciple Course. So I told, I told Krishna Prabhu that we have to make it more clear. What are the standards for initiation in ISKCON? Yes, Maharaj, and especially, uh, you know, regarding uh, no illicit sex. I'm myself a medical doctor. So the reason we came to ISKCON, because outside it's really... Uh, animal life. So when we read Prabhupada's books that uh, we should not live like animals, that's why we came inside. So sometimes like uh, by Krishna's grace we are following but sometimes people think we are too fanatic when we guide others that you know no illicit sex means no abortion, no contraception. Definitely. That, is, that <laughs> should be no abortion, no contraception, yes, n no birth control, Pills. these things. Yeah these points are, are, should be made clear. They think we are too hard in uh, preaching this way, but that's the basic. Yes, this is the basic. Well, those people who are serious will follow. You, other people, they want to cheat. And so, you, you, actually, you cannot cheat Krishna. They're thinking they're cheating. They think they can do it, get away with it. But you cannot cheat Krishna. Krishna knows what everyone is doing. And so, it, it, it's up to them. If they feel that they can, they're doing these things and they th think they can do it and not suffer, that's their own ignorance. Thank you, Maharaj. One last thing, so as a preachers, we should not recommend uh, such devotees uh, for initiations who are not willing to follow the standards properly. Because when the Guru gets karma and the preacher who is uh, recommending, he will also get karma. Isn't it, Maharaj? Yes, exactly true. Jai Pataka, I was with Jai Pataka Swami one time and he was saying to somebody that someone was recommending someone for initiation. So Jai Pataka Swami said to the preacher, are you ready to take the half, half the karma? And, and, you know, <laughs> and the person was shocked. Oh, 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 oh me? Oh. <laughs> Well, he said, you're bringing the person to me for initiation. You want me to take the karma. Are you ready to take the karma? If you're not ready to take the karma yourself, don't bring them for initiation. You should, they should be ready. They should be convinced that they're going to follow. Otherwise, to give initiation, it has no meaning. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thanks. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj, for your wonderful class. So, we thank Maharaj by chanting the Hare Krishna Mahamantra loudly. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. 
ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರೇ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೇ ಹರೇ ಹಿಜೋಲಿನೆಸ್ ಭಕ್ತಿ ವಿಘ್ನ ವಿನಾಶಜ್ಞ ಸಿಂಗ್ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಮಹಾರಾಜ್ ಕಿ